it gives me great pleasure uh, to engage in conversation here at Central Connecticut State University with Jane Roland Martin. Uh, Jane is one of the outstanding intellectual figures in education of the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, she uh, is Professor Emerita of Philosophy at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and is also a past president of the Philosophy of Education Society. Jane's work, which is known all around the world, has been translated into several languages, and she has uh, been awarded uh, many honors and fellowships uh, from different major institutions. These fellowships have come from the Guggenheim Foundation, they have come from uh, the National Science Foundation, the Bunting Institute of Radcliffe College, and the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Uh, the Rutledge publication of a few years ago entitled 50 Modern Thinkers in Education from Piaget to Today actually includes a chapter on Martin's work. Uh, Jane's own major writings are, are many, but uh, several are worth mentioning in particular, and these would include Reclaiming a Conversation, uh, The School Home, Changing the Educational Landscape, and her most recent book, Education Reconfigured. So Jane, it's a great pleasure to welcome you on campus and uh, to have this opportunity to talk with you. Uh, most of our time, I expect, will be uh, focused on considering ideas of your own, but I thought it might be helpful if we could begin by you telling us a little bit about those writers that you have found uh, most influential in developing your own ideas over the years. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Daniel, You're for having welcome. me. This is, this is an amazing opportunity for me also because it's forced me to go back and look what I've, at what I've written over all these years. And if you think I can remember from all the <laughs> way back, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, who, has, who has influenced me? Is that what you're asking? Yes, I guess what, so, yeah. what writers? Uh, Plato's Republic for his philosophy of education. Rousseau, Rousseau's Emile, and John Dewey. But then I have to say about Dewey, mm -hmm. it was not so much reading Dewey, it's that I imbibed him with my childhood and growing oh, yes. up because Indeed. of the school I went Indeed. to. I went to a Dewey-influenced school. C could you tell us a little bit about that, Jane, and, and, and you know your thoughts about it as you look back over the years? What can I say? It was the most, it was wonderful experience from beginning to end and very, very formative, I think, in, to my life. Mm -hmm. And I now have interviews with a whole lot of my classmates. So I'm finding out that it also was very formative in mm -hmm. their lives. It was very much influenced by Dewey's way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a way I grew up with Dewey's thought. When mm -hmm. I came to read him much mm -hmm. later, yes. To everyone else, John Dewey is a great surprise, yes, I suppose. Sure, and, sure. you know, it was just kind of old hat I in a see. way to me because I knew it. I had lived it. Sure, sure. So. So, so when you look back on it nowadays and you think of what's going on in our schools today, uh, do you say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're, we're rid of that? Or, or more likely, do you say, I wish to goodness we could incorporate some of those elements in schooling as, as we go forward today? Well, that's why I'm writing my book. I see. The mm -hmm. latter, right? I'm writing this book because I do think that on the one hand, we've forgotten all about the progressive schools that were, well, there were many of them in, mm -hmm. in my, in my mm -hmm. day, in my mm -hmm. childhood, and that they do have a lot to teach us, mm -hmm. at least mine. I don't want to generalize sure. about progressive mm -hmm. education in general, but my, my school really does mm -hmm. have a lot to mm -hmm. teach us. So mm -hmm. when I Look at the fact that everybody is so worried about whether children can read and look, they're in the first grade or they're in the second grade and they can't read yet. One of my grandsons was, I think, had finished first grade and had, couldn't yet read and everybody thought he was, you know, going to be a non-reader and possibly a moron. <laughs> <laughs> and in my school, they didn't teach they didn't give formal instruction reading until we were seven, which was second grade. They okay. didn't even dream of starting My it goodness. till then. And you know, we all ended up, we, I can read. Yeah, <laughs> we, indeed, right. Yeah. We can all read. Yeah, sure. Yeah. If I can just move the conversation a little bit forward, um, uh, and I know that for me, uh, as for others, uh, one of the 
elements or dimensions of education philosophy that you moved into uh, was the whole idea of trying to resurrect the place of the experience of women in education. And uh, one of your early articles, well, one of your articles of the early 80s is a very, very widely cited article called um, Excluding Women from the Educational Realm. And uh, that has become a sort of a, a, a sort of a, a flagship, a flagship uh, a reference point, if you like, in, in opening the door to the exploration of in what way women's experience ought to be brought into the discussion of educational issues, to the framing of educational policy and so forth. W would you like to elaborate a little bit on what, what brought you to that point and, and where you stand on it today? Well, what brought me to the point of even studying women uh, was the fact, was the women's movement to begin with, mm -hmm. and the fact that in the 19, starting I guess in the 1970s and then the 1980s, uh, in, in all the academic disciplines, probably, oh, probably all of them, women were looking at the, the disciplines themselves, the fields of knowledge, and saying, oh my goodness, people hadn't realized this. Women are missing. They're missing from the narratives in history, from the, the uh, theories in the social sciences and in the sciences and so on. Either the women are missing or our lives and experiences are being misrepresented and distorted. And that it seemed to me, partly also from personal experience sure. in the mm -hmm. field, that this was probably true also of the field of education okay. and educational mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. And so I just decided I, that's what I would. Okay. I was about to become president of the Philosophy of Education Indeed. Society, mm -hmm. and I decided that I would give my presidential address yes. on that. Mm -hmm. So, but the thing is, when I started to work on it, I had thought, okay, I give this one lecture, and I've, and I've done, yes, that, done. Sure. And the thing, the, it, the project expanded. I, I wrote see. one paper. It wasn't the one I meant to write. I wrote another one. Mm -hmm. I ended up in the one year writing four papers on the exclusion of women I from see. the field, mm -hmm. you, you know, before I, before I knew it. And in the course of this, I made, I guess, my first discovery was that the women are missing yes. from educational mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. Women, there have been women thinkers about education, philosophers, theorists, whatever you want to call us, sure. and com we're completely missing from the textbooks, Indeed. the mm -hmm. anthologies, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. But my, that was my first uh, discovery, we're missing. Second discovery, which in some ways I thought was probably more important, is that we women carry with us a great deal of cultural baggage. Mm -hmm. So if you bring us into the picture, into the story, mm -hmm. into the theories or the histories or the narratives, you can't just bring female individuals mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. You're bringing all the cultural paraphernalia, mm -hmm. which means the whole, what other people have called the world or sphere of the private home and yes. family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with that, all kinds of knowledge, skill, attitudes, values, and so on, that are associated with that. So Jane, when you say women brought a lot of baggage with them, you mean baggage in a, both a positive and maybe a negative sense, but certainly a, a wide range of experience uh, in, in the various kinds of activities that you're now just alluding to. Right, what I now call cultural stock. Okay. In my later work, I started calling cultural stock, but that work grew out of this perception of women this all we as a culture have a great deal of cultural wealth and also cultural liabilities. Mm -hmm. Some things that that we pass down from one generation to another that some are real assets and some are liabilities. Mm -hmm. But a lot of a lot of them are associated. A lot of this stock is associated with the world of the private home yes, and indeed. family sure. and with women because it's been historically women's place. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you exclude women from the theories of the field, 
you're excluding also all that cultural mm -hmm. stock, all mm -hmm. those activities, mm -hmm. all the knowledge that mm -hmm. is associated mm -hmm. with that, mm -hmm. which means you're, you know, half of life is missing, which means, Daniel, <laughs> that whatever theories you've developed are, have to be incomplete. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Right? All mm -hmm. those theories that are based just on men's experience sure. mm -hmm. and that we were operating with for all those years were partial in a sense of incomplete. Now, one of these theories, presumably, is the sort of historical theory of a liberal education. And uh, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned earlier, uh, you, you, you talked about some of the limitations of uh, analytical philosophy. And you also referred to your presidential address. And of course, in your presidential address, and in another article closely related in time to that one called Needed a New Paradigm for Liberal Education, you began to question uh, the very widely popular views of uh, two prominent English philosophers of education, uh, Paul Hirst and R.S. Peters. Uh, and you, you began to argue that there are deficiencies in the sort of standard accepted view of liberal education. Uh, and then you, you begin to argue that, you know, one of the weaknesses of liberal education is that it, it addresses half of the cultural wealth of the, the human race. Uh, and that cultural wealth is what is contained largely in academic disciplines, which in many ways are primarily the product of male inquiry. Uh, and then you want to go on and say, look, this is a limited view of what a liberal education should consist in. Am I right about that? And where, where else should it go, if that's a limited view? <laughs> that's a complicated question that you just <laughs> asked. For, uh, first of all, when you were asking me, I do want to get this in, when you sure. were asking me what uh, authors influenced mm -hmm. me, um, I didn't mention R.S. Peters okay. and Paul Hurst. But at the, uh, about the time that I was in graduate school was exactly the time that they were starting to write. Sure. And before we knew it, their writings had taken, really become sort of paradigmatic mm -hmm. in, in the field of philosophy mm -hmm. of education, mm -hmm. certainly in, in England mm -hmm. and the Commonwealth countries, but also for the most part, I think, in this, in think this so, country, yes. mm -hmm. too. So I quickly, and this is undoubtedly because of my Dewey in background, mm -hmm. began to see problems with, with with their perspective. Mm -hmm. So long before I uh, started to study women and tried to bring women into the, the educational realm, I was had become critical of Hearst and Peter's okay. writing as much too narrow. And you said they only bring half the wealth. And I have the feeling if we started really to calculate it, yes, it's probably yeah, about yeah. a quarter perhaps, <laughs> or perhaps, maybe an yeah, eighth yeah, yeah. of the wealth. Because before uh, that article called Needed, Needed, Needed to what, a New Paradigm, a new for, new paradigm for Liberal Education. I think you know my titles better than I, <laughs> than I do. Um, that was before I, I wrote that, before I had st uh, studied women, the place of women in educational okay. thought. Mm -hmm. And I had already seen that what they're talking about, and this is really the standard accepted view of liberal education, is an education in the, in the disciplines or fields of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's an education for observers of the world mm -hmm. as opposed to participants in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What they actually say is the value of this kind of education is it gives you a lens through which, which to look at experience. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it doesn't give you experience. Oh, it gets, see, yes, it, uh, my schooling, see, my early schooling uh -huh. gave us experience. I see. Mm -hmm. But a liberal education won't give you experience. It will give you experience. The direct experience you get is of the disciplines mm -hmm. of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll sort of get the beginnings of how to be a historian, how to be a literary critic, how to be a philosopher, and so on. And you'll have ways of looking at the world. That's what they think it gives you. Mm -hmm. And that's very broadening. And it, it, it can be. It mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. I had some of that as an undergraduate, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't give it up for anything, okay. I suppose. So it, it does make an important contribution, or may do so. It makes an important contribution. 
But to say that that is what liberal education is, is to make liberal education something kind of illiberal. Mm -hmm. in, if you're thinking of liberal in the sense of generous, yes. mm -hmm. a liberal person as a generous mm -hmm. person, you know. Uh, it's a very, taking a very narrow view, first of all, of what education is all about, that mm -hmm. education is, of, is for the development of mind, mm -hmm. and actually not really mind, not in large view of mind, yes. but a very narrow yes. view of mm -hmm. mind is mm -hmm. rational thinking yes. <clears throat> and seeing the world through the eyes or the lenses of these various disciplines. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole range of experience out there mm -hmm. that has nothing to do or very little to do with those academic disciplines, yes. including, mm -hmm. you know, most of life, I think, <laughs> most of actual living, mm -hmm. which is excluded. So how, 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 how did liberal education get away with it for so long? <laughs> you, <don't, laughs> you know better than I do, but I do think it goes all the way back to Plato. I'm sure, it yes. Goes back Back to Plato mm -hmm. and back to Aristotle. And we have to realize that all the people who are saying it's so wonderful and it should be for everyone, mm -hmm. that it started out as the education for just an elite. Indeed. Mm -hmm. An intellectual elite who were not going to have to mm -hmm. do any manual mm -hmm. labor. Mm -hmm. Other classes of society were going to do the work. Yes. So mm -hmm. this is an education for those people who don't have to do any work with their hands mm -hmm. or with machines mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. technology or whatever. Mm -hmm. so, so then is it, is it a, a limited model for what one might call a general or, or a more complete education? Uh, and, uh, and whether it is or not, what, what might constitute a more complete form of education? Uh, presumably, the academic disciplines are important for most people, uh, but, but uh, if there are other elements in the culture that people should know in order to engage successfully in everyday living, wh what might some of those be? Do they refer to education of the emotions? Is there, is there reference here to knowledge for engaging in action, for civic engagement, and so forth? Like all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, the, the way people in general, and still today, and I don't think this has much changed, uh, people are thinking of liberal education as the ed development of mind. They're not talking about, uh, and they are talking about citizenship. So they think that this is really necessary for to be a citizen of a democracy. But it's just education for thinking, and you can think all you like, but that's not really what democracy is, just not about thinking. It's about doing and mm -hmm. acting and living. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a way of life. Mm -hmm. And so liberal education is really not much about that. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. if we're going to have a really liberal, liberal, yes, if we're going to have sure. a liber liberalized liberal education, yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have to think of it. I th In the article you're talking about, I thought of I, I talked about it as what we need is an education for the development of persons, yes. mm -hmm. not just minds. Mm -hmm. And I had in mind there pers people who who have minds and bodies and feelings and emotions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and who live in the world. Mm -hmm. Then when I did my study of women, I realized, which I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. Although I, maybe I did, <laughs> I don't think I did. Sure. That liberal education is also uh, meant to be preparation for life in the public world, and is t uh, turning its back on the w private world of mm -hmm. the home. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And if it's really going to be liberal education, we live in both worlds. And why isn't it education for life in both private and public mm -hmm. realms? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it any longer a useful sort of term or, or construct mm -hmm. then? In other words, given everything you just say, might one be better trying to maybe introduce a different terminology here, a terminology like either general or complete that might allow for a broader conceptualization of what constitutes, let's say, a good education? Maybe. 
Maybe. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I guess I haven't made up my mm -hmm. mind about mm -hmm. that. But it isn't everything because there's still a vocational education yes. mm -hmm. is different. Mm -hmm. Where vocational education is training for work, mm -hmm. for job mm -hmm. training and work and so on. So uh, whatever we're talking about and whatever you call it yes. is still mm -hmm. different from vocational and professional yes, education okay. mm -hmm. and technical education. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. it's it's mm -hmm. not it's not all of education. Yes. yes. One other thing I think now that I didn't even dream of before is that when we're talking about liberal education, we almost always are thinking of well, maybe high school and yes. definitely college yes. level. Yes, yes. But there's no need to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. It's something that, that I have the feeling we should think about as going on throughout life mm -hmm. and taking place in all different parts mm -hmm. of society, mm -hmm. not just in school. Indeed. Actually, that was the, a point I was just about to, to bring into the discussion. Uh, if, if the idea of a, a good education includes the academic subjects to a greater or lesser extent, but also includes, includes other forms of education, uh, can the schools do it all? Now, I know you've addressed that question, uh, and you have said there are multiple educational agencies that exist. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, to what extent one can argue that the school should be confined just to the academics and that these other, other forms of education should take place outside the school, in homes, in uh, uh, after-school activities by children, uh, in summer camps, etc. Um, depends. I guess the answer to your question de depends on the kind of society we're talking about. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about contemporary American society, actually what's happening is that a lot of the education that perhaps used to take place in homes and in, in the community and so on isn't happening so much there anymore. Yes. Mm -hmm. and we are, to some extent, I feel, this, this goes back actually, we have to talk about John Dewey for mm, sure, a, a minute. Do. And this is mm -hmm. not, not, I didn't learn this at Little Red, I learned this from reading Dewey. Okay. Is Dewey had this great insight long time ago where he said, home, he's talking about the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. and he says, home has changed radically. Mm -hmm. And by that he meant that industry used to be located in, in the home, Indeed, yes. and it was mm -hmm. taken out into the yes, factories sure. and so on. He says when home changes, then school has to change. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's extremely profound. Mm -hmm. And his answer was, so we have to put work, in the, or at least the, the uh, good things associated with work, like uh, respond, a sense of responsibility yes. mm -hmm. and attention to experience and detail, all these things, mm -hmm. uh, we have to put these into school because yes. they're no longer learning that at home. Mm -hmm. So I want to say the same thing now. Home has changed radically. Mm -hmm. Both father, it used to be just fathers going. With the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. men went out to work. Indeed. And in poor families, so did women. Yes. But in mm -hmm. all other families, women stayed home and took care of their children. Mm -hmm. Now, no matter what, almost no matter what the economic level, both sexes mm -hmm. go out to work. Mm -hmm. And we have to ask what is being lost at, in so many homes, mm -hmm. what kinds of values, like what I call the three C's of care, concern and connection, Indeed. are not being acquired by children at home Indeed. and need to be acquired in yes, school. Yes, sure. And it's, not, it's not only that. If we look at communities and the sense of, uh, a sense of community that there used to be mm -hmm. in, around, around the home and sure. so on, and all, ki sure. all kinds of cultural wealth that kids learn there, and not necessarily, well, I'm not sure kids go out in the community anymore. Mm -hmm. They're tied mm -hmm. to their machines Indeed. and their parents are driving them around because mm -hmm. they're scared to have them walk down the block to mm -hmm. school, you know, like children used to do and so on. So 
children are much in many ways more ice much more mm -hmm. isolated than mm -hmm. they used to be mm -hmm. and they're not going to get what they perhaps learn by what you're suggesting get, picking it up in the community yes. in the mm -hmm. playground and mm -hmm. so on mm -hmm. and so we have to ask if some of those things aren't things that schools should be teaching mm -hmm. and there are at the same time things maybe like even science mm -hmm. and history that other in, uh, institutions yes. in, in society could be teaching. I see, okay. I think we really have to think bigger and think about juggling the whole situation yes, I understand. around. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm guessing, though I don't know enough about it to be sure, that the introduction of you know, communications technology today, computers, etc., make possible you know, the, 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 the education of the young through forms of uh, communication that didn't exist ever before. Um, but before leaving that point about you know, the, the changed nature of home and the possibility that it, it, it raises new uh, forms of uh, education that should take place in schools, uh, what about the role of parents in this? Uh, yes, homes have changed. We often have two working family, two parents in the family working now. Uh, the, the notion of uh, preparing parents for education in this new changed world th th does that come into your your thinking? And and, and if so, w w what do you think might be avenues to explore? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking back to when my first baby was handed to me <laughs> in the hospital, and I said, I don't know what to do. And they looked at me, they said, oh, of course, you know, of course, ma mommy, mother, you'll know what to do. And I hadn't a clue. And then I can only say it gets worse the older your children are. It gets harder and harder. So I completely agree with you if you're saying that parents need education. <laughs> Parents do. Parents need to be educated to be parents, mm -hmm. and on, on need to be educated to be. Also, what is it? They need to be educated in parenting and in in uh, thinking about what what cultural stock they should be passing down mm -hmm. to their children mm -hmm. and what cultural stock they shouldn't mm -hmm. be passing down. Mm -hmm. It's a huge issue, mm -hmm. I think, and of mm -hmm. course, parents are involved. But on the, on the other hand, there, we have to remember, two parents may be out to work, or there may be only one parent. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Or there may be no parents, mm -hmm. just older kids in mm -hmm. the house. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of situations out there. And the idea that we can rely on parents to do everything that the schools aren't doing and schools should just be doing academics, mm -hmm. I think is pie in the sky. Actually, this is my moment for bringing up something in connection with what influenced me, reading that influenced me. Oh, yes, indeed. Only mm -hmm. it's not reading. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Have, did you ever see The Wire? No. The Wire was a TV series, mm -hmm. which I didn't see on television. I saw it on DVD, so okay. I could skip the ads. <laughs> Several years long, and it's about schools in uh, in Baltimore and about housing projects, mm -hmm. and it had a I just saw it a couple of years ago. It mm -hmm. had a tremendous influence on me, and I kind of think that everyone who has anything to do about education, schooling, mm -hmm. or anything else ought to see that. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right to know what the world is really like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, Jane, I think it's in your book, Cultural Miseducation, uh, when you examine the agencies of education other than schools and presumably other than, than homes. Uh, you, you raise the question that the media, and specifically television, uh, can be a major educational force in the lives of young and old, presumably. And then you also made the point that, by contrast with schools, typically, uh, where schools are held highly accountable uh, to the public. Uh, uh, many times um, media institutions are not. Uh, and you express grave concern that there, there's a sort of, there may well be a, a, a counter-cultural influence coming from the media, from television and so forth. 
Uh, and and you, w while you expressed grave concern about that, you didn't seem to want to go quite so far as to advocate for censorship. So I, I'm wondering, how does one grapple with the problem of having schools promote certain highly accountable forms of education and we'll say the media, specifically television, being with, without almost any sense of accountability? The way you describe it, we have a crazy society mm -hmm. that allows this to happen, mm -hmm. especially since uh, the, some of the media often, if we think of media generally, yes. I mean, not mm -hmm. necessarily anyway, or television may be passe. For all I know, television sure. is passe sure. and we're on to other forms. But what, what I call, in that book I call cultural miseducation, mm -hmm. I think is rampant. In, in American society, and probably, in, uh, I'm not suggesting only here, in many, many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem is we don't hold, th th these are uh, television, DVDs, um, internet, all mm -hmm. the, uh, what, whatever. The, these are all educational agents, mm -hmm. just as much as school is. And if, they, if we don't, as a people, acknowledge that fact, we can't hold them. It's hard to hold an institution responsible for miseducating mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. not just children, but adults, too, yes. mm -hmm. if you're not saying that, if you're not admitting that they're educators. Mm -hmm. So I believe we have to recognize that these are all educational agents mm -hmm. or agencies. Mm -hmm. And we have to think about how, we have to worry about the fact that a lot of what they're transmitting to the next generation and to our generation mm -hmm. is cultural liabilities, yes. mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. things like hatred mm -hmm. and sure. greed and mm -hmm. consumerism mm -hmm. and, you, and racism, you, mm -hmm. you name it. So the question is how to do it. And I think one of the reasons people are afraid to talk about it is because it looks as if censorship is yes, the only indeed. answer. Sure. Mm -hmm. And going back to Plato, mm -hmm. as one always has to, <laughs> that's what Plato did. Mm -hmm. Plato mm -hmm. saw this problem. We don't see it. Mm -hmm. Plato, see. Two, more than 2,000 years ago, Plato mm -hmm. saw the problem. Sure. And his answer was censorship. Mm -hmm. Censor all the stories. Mm -hmm. Only allow stories in that the censors agree to. Sure. And, and everything will be all right. Mm -hmm. And if you live in a democracy and you yes. believe in free speech, yes. you can't go along yes. with that. Mm -hmm. But there is, as I try to argue, yes. in, in cultural miseducation, mm -hmm. and again, I think in education reconfigured mm -hmm. a bit, there is a, a middle way, a middle mm -hmm. ground mm -hmm. between letting these institutions do whatever they want. Okay. <laughs> and that is to try to, first of all, to hold them responsible, mm -hmm. to try to get, uh, you know, talk, talk them, persuade them mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. ch changing. And, but another thing is, and this is where school c can come in, I mm -hmm. think, is for schools to teach kids what I call uh, mediation between whatever the thing is that the television or, or the media is presenting to the kids, with the message that they're getting, teaching them how to mediate that message, mm -hmm. teaching mm -hmm. them to say, wait a minute, okay. mm -hmm. what are they teaching us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't, isn't this racism? Yes. Why should mm -hmm. I believe that? Mm -hmm. Or teaching them how to deconstruct what they mm -hmm. see. I think mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. one thing you can mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. And I th another thing is to convince all kinds of educational agents to put out in the media um, healthy, mm -hmm. <laughs> edu educative messages mm -hmm. and stories and uh, Even science. Even <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and stories and fiction and whatever mm -hmm. that are educative rather than mm -hmm. miseducative. Mm -hmm. Last question. <laughs> uh, we've, co we've covered a fair bit of territory here, but th this would be my, my, my last question then, my really last question. Is, is there anything that you know, we haven't talked about that you'd like to elaborate on in any way? I think, I think 
we've done pretty well I here, we haven't have, yes. we? Was, is there anything that I, that I think I do, I guess, oh yeah, I want to mention two, two concepts, I guess, mm -hmm. yes, right, that we right. didn't, that I didn't talk about, we didn't talk about. And one is what I call the problem of generations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's what are what people need to be thinking about today and maybe what our political leaders need to be mm -hmm. thinking about mm -hmm. today if, that if you look at education you can look at education from the standpoint of the individual what should Johnny learn what should Mary learn yes. mm -hmm. and that's fine and that's what we do all the time mm -hmm. we may not get right what they learn but that's what we do mm -hmm. but it's also vitally important to look at education from the standpoint of the culture and when you do that, that's when you begin to see all these different educational agents. And that's when you begin to see that some of them are purveying miseducation, mm -hmm. rather. And it's also when you begin to see that there's all this cultural wealth, and you have to ask the question, are we passing it all, are we passing the wealth down? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem of generations, educationally yes. speaking, mm -hmm. is the problem of how to, in a sense, maximize mm -hmm. the passing down of the wealth of our culture sure. and minimize the mm -hmm. passing down of, of the cultural liabilities, sure. mm -hmm. all the bad things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. So maybe that's, that's Very all. good. That's great. Well, Jane, this really has been a pleasure, uh, most enlightening and um, as always, a, a conversation that raises additional questions that maybe we'll come back to some other time. I so hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you yes, so much. Sure, for you're very welcome. You. And that's where we'll leave it for this afternoon. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.